everyone, and welcome to the Uplifting Impact podcast. I'm Deanna Singh, the Chief Change Agent here with Uplifting Impact, and I am so excited, as I am every week, to be able to host you as we dive deeper into this whole journey around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And today I am particularly excited because I am talking to somebody that I am a huge fangirl of. I have on the line with us today, Miss Ashley Hines. Ashley is an advocate, a strategist, and an entrepreneur who's really dedicated to equipping communities to advance equity and create spaces where everyone feels safe, valued, and respected. If you've ever spent any time, even like five seconds with Ashley, you know that she lives that every single moment of her life. After nearly two decades of extensive cross-sector experience, and she currently serves as the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Advocate Aurora Healthcare, a top 12 uh, U.S. not-for-profit healthcare system, and also a wonderful partner of Uplifting Impact. In her role, Ashley focuses on partnering with leaders as a strategic advisor to achieve system-wide goals and launching, scaling, and sustaining DE and I interventions, programs, and initiatives. She has received several distinctions. Uh, there's, there's really too many of them for me to name all of them, but here's just a few. She was the 2020-21 Harvard Business School's uh, Young American Leaders Program. She also received the 2020 United Way of Greater Milwaukee and Waukesha County's Philanthropic Five Award. And she was a 40 under 40 uh, for the Milwaukee Business Journal. And today she's a guest on our show. Welcome, (laughs) Ashley. So proud to have you here. Thank you, Deanna. I'm so thrilled to be here. We just love the fact that we get a chance to talk to people who really are invested, not just in their day-to-day, like what they do at work, but really invested in what they do out in the greater world. And when I think about you, Ashley, I think about that, right? That there's, I, 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 I don't see a line between how much wonderful work you do in the community and how much wonderful work you do in the organization. So one of the questions that I have, right, since you're to me, the way I see it, you're constantly working, is <laughs> what brings you joy? Like what gives you that energy, that spark uh, that people feel when we get to see you in all those different spaces? Absolutely. And thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, I equally fangirl you, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a very unoriginal response, which is my family. I will say though, specifically, it's time with them and traveling with them. Um, I have two small children. So I have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. And it's just so much fun to experience new things with them. You know, the joy and the lens of a child. And so I just love doing that. I love exposing them. I love spending time with them. And so uh, they ground me (laughs) and certainly give me that energy to go back out and do the things that I do. And then I learned so much about myself through my children. So. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, I think that that's such an, before we started recording, we were talking about um, my five-year-old nephew who uh, very, very matter-of-factly told me that he didn't have time in his schedule to do something I wanted to to do with him, um, which, you know, is really funny. And it, we, we, we had a really good giggle about it, but it is really interesting, right? Because our children are experiencing the world in a very different kind of way than the way that we did. And so even as I like prodded him some more, like, but what are you doing? What is it that you have? Why you don't have any time to do this? Why is this right? He taught so me a funny. lot about what his priorities are, right? Like where he's putting his energy and time. And so I think if you can have that heart of, yeah, I can learn things from, from my five-year-old, my two-year-old, my seven-year-old, so whatever their age might be, there's, there is so much wealth of knowledge there. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love it. And I totally resonate with it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So let's jump into some of the, the work that you've done. And I think one of the big you know, things I'm curious about, especially given the fact that you spend a lot of time in this space and we're kind of at that, you know, that time where we're thinking about what should we be doing next? Where should we be going? What are some of the critical questions that DEI leaders and allies should be asking themselves and their organizations, given the moment that we're in right now, Ashley? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a very important question. And when I reflected on it, for me, it's making sure that we're clear on the why. Uh, so uh, what's the vision? Like, why are we doing this? Because I recognize that prior to last summer, 
Um, many organizations really were far removed from the the truly deadly impacts of racism and other forms of oppression. Um, and so they scurried, right? Like people got together really quick to try to respond and show up, which I think was important. I recognize that some folks didn't get a chance to reflect and really kind of settle in because the light just turned on, right? And so I get that. And I think that it's important for organizations to make sure that they do that work still. Um, for me, having a clear purpose and why that's the core of your work. It's the grounding for everything you do. Um, and it also helps you to focus, focus your energy and your resources um, so that when you aren't seeing the metrics shift as quick as you want them to, or things change as, you know, we can get impatient, it really helps to center you. Um, so that would be the first question. The other question I think about is where are we starting? And so I think when I look at this point in time, um, it's critical to get feedback, constantly having a feedback loop and assessing where you are and how people are experiencing you um, as an organization. It, it takes a huge commitment to listen to people and really listen to them and don't have them to try to rationalize or, you know, like validate it. Just listen to how people are experiencing you and take that data towards where you want to go. Um, not everyone is experiencing our organizations the same and favorably, if you will, but we're only as good as the folks who are experiencing us the least favorably, in my opinion. <laughs> so those are the folks we really have to listen to and be um, open to the feedback. Um, and then the last critical question that comes to mind for me is, what is the leadership support and investment? Um, and I share all these and there's no rank. I think you have to do all of them and have to really assess and be honest about all of them. But um, being real about this, it, it, are, is this something we're just doing to check the box? Or are we really committed to seeing d and thrive and be sustainable? Having the accountability, you know, we talk about metrics and measures and goals, and that's what that does. Um, but also, like, what's the money we're willing to put into the FTEs? the time commitment, the volunteer leadership, all of that is crucial. And I think it's more than just picking a person to lead it. You know, it really has to be a commitment to embedding this across your organization in a collaborative way. So those are my thoughts on, on, on some critical questions. I mean, the why, the where, and the what. I was taking all, taking all, all kinds of notes. And I actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to pick them apart just a little yeah, bit further please. because I think that they're such it's such an important way to be thinking about what we're doing. I feel like what you said and the way you said it was so amazing because it's exactly what I see as one of the biggest challenges with the clients that we work with, right? Is that they got in good intentions, really like from the right spot, really wanting to like make change, right? And see the change that they were making. But because we skipped over that reflection component, and we don't know the why, like you said, when we get into like this moment, we're like, this isn't working or we have some pushback or, uh, you know, or we're, we're, we've got to make some decisions about where we put our time and energy it becomes really easy, right. To see people walk away from it. And I think one of the things that we've seen again, across lots of different industries, different size organizations and everything is that when that why isn't there. Then when it comes time to make some of the strategic decisions that would actually create the transformation, we miss it. Yeah, no, that is real. And I think when we don't have the why, we're not clear on why we should even be listening to people. <laughs> so when, for example, when you're getting that data, you know, we talk about asking those critical questions. It can be easy to put up a defense, you know, because we're our organizations and many of our leadership, I believe most people are trying to do well. That's just the way I choose to navigate the world, right? Yep, I agree. Um, but we can put up these defenses when folks are saying, well, hey, I'm not experiencing the organization like that. I feel like my voice is being stifled. I feel like my experience is not valued. I feel like I don't have leadership opportunities. I feel like this policy is, you know, not allowing me to show up. Then we kind of discount all of that. We just it becomes background noise because we're not really clear. We haven't listened to those stories and we haven't realized the true gift that feedback is. And yeah. when people put themselves out there and are vulnerable about how they are experiencing our organizations, 
we shut it down. And I think that's the growth. That's the, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's interesting is kind of going to the second one of like, where are we starting from? So we do all kinds of support, like, you know, uh, whether it's one-on-one meetings or uh, cohorts kind of coming together and having conversations or focus groups or surveying. There's lots of different tools, right, in, in our mm-hmm. toolbox to gather some of the information you just said. And one of the things that I think happens quite frequently is we get the information. We have the data. We literally, like, we have a, a policy, especially from, like, our surveys. We don't go in as much as it sometimes pains me to see sometimes a punctuation issue that I want to fix or, you know, we don't change any of it. We just share it back. That sometimes it can be like you have this moment where you're like, Oh, but I don't want anybody to feel that way. Or, but I, but mm-hmm. we are trying these things. But we are. Do- and one of the things that we have to say now, right? We say it before we even share the data, is what you see here might actually not be the reality. You might be doing the things that people say that you're not doing, but the perception yep. is just as powerful <laughs> as whatever wow. you think the reality might be. Do you see that too in your work? I absolutely see it. And um, the way that you've shared it is so true because we also have to own, um, you know, it's this whole conversation of intent versus impact, right? And I know you're you're no stranger to that, but we have to own how people are experiencing us, even if it doesn't align with our intentions and what we want to be. Again, I I think organizations and, and the leaders that lead them have Um, good intentions for the most part, right? Like, I don't think anyone is going through the day thinking, I want to make people feel bad. I want to disenfranchise. Like, I don't think there's a, I don't think most people are doing that. (laughs) So, but we have to own the impact and we have to recognize that maybe shedding a light on things that we're just not even in the seat to experience. You know, when I look at leaders, again, I said this, they can be so far removed from how people are experiencing their organization based on their title (laughs) and based on their status in the organization. So there's a, there's a lot there that perception versus reality. um, And that's the gap, right? Like that's, that's where the equity work and the opportunity is for us. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then just real quickly, because the support and investment piece is so huge. I Mm -hmm. cannot tell you how many times I have conversations with people who are leading, you know, initiatives or doing work or whatever. And they just get to this point. Like I can almost see like the tears welling up in their eyes because the desire is there. The support is there. The need is there and the resources aren't Mm -hmm. right. And so I just, I, I don't have a question there. I just wanted to highlight that. Like, I I think it's important. (laughs) Yeah, it is important. And I'll say this, I think, you know, it can be a um, iterative process, something that you phase to, right? Like I get that you may not be able to pull out a budget line item that can get you quickly to the capacity. Exactly. But I think you have to have the commitment to recognizing that growth. Most organizations are starting, I'll just be frank with what I see in my seat with one person, like they're hiring a person (laughs) to do the work and or bringing in a consultant to kind of support. Um, But that's not sustainable, right? Like this is not a one person job. It's not a department's role. It is a a aspiration for how we want to show up as an organization. It's far more than a strategy. It is literally a being, right? And so it has to be embedded. So I think there's some things organizations can still do without having that investment to be creative with how you protect people's time, (laughs) how you value the time that volunteers spend on advancing BNI. All of those things can help to be creative when the, the funds aren't necessarily there at the forefront. Oh yeah. And I love that. Like, it's not just resources, dollars. It is resources and time in energy, in uh, social capital, right. In right. Like in, in elevating people in just even recognizing the work that is being done. So I think that there's so many different things that we can pull into and it just, it's the limit. only limitation is our creativity. Mm. However, if we're not even intentionally having the conversation, it, that's where we, that's where I think we run. That's where I think I get the tears welling up, <laughs> no. right? Because, because that's where it happens. Okay. So a little, little bit different conversation, a little bit different question. Um, curious about effective ways to educate employees about diversity, equity, inclusion. So you have a huge employee base, right? We have organizations that have even small bases, but everybody's asking that same question. What do we do 
when we're trying to educate our workforce on some of these topics? And, you know, what are some of the resources that you've used to encourage your employees to really take advantage of, uh, of so that they can learn more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, at Advocate Aurora, we do have over 70,000 uh, team members in our workforce. So yes, quite a large workforce, but I've worked in organizations and served in organizations that are smaller. And some of the things that I've reflected on that have been beneficial are first that acknowledgement that everyone learns differently. Everyone digests information and content differently. And um, so for me, it's, I love that at AAH, we partner with our leadership development team and really co-create a lot of our DNI learning and embed it into some of our leadership development because those are folks who really understand how people learn, right? Like they're yeah. experts at different learning modalities. And so it's not a one size fits all. We of course have self-paced and we have discussion style question or learnings. We have case studies, meeting, inter- I mean, there's the, it's endless. But what we know is that everyone's gonna connect to the learning differently. And we also know that humans have to see things over and over and over <laughs> to really get it right. That, um, that repeating it and making sure that there is, um, uh, how do I put it? We have to say sometimes the same thing, different ways, <laughs> over, you know, it's just the way we learn. Yeah. Um, so I think one, just an acknowledgement of human learning process. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think about, it's really important to have a foundational learning Every organization is different. I know um, in a previous organization, we actually partnered with the outside vendor, did a train the trainer. And my at AH, we have an unconscious bias training that everyone you know takes. And I do think these foundational learnings are important. I recognize that some folks are just checking the box. I get it. I'm not like <laughs> that is not lost on me. But what I also think it does is one, it sets the tone and the value for the learning and the prioritization for it, the space for it. Um, But that shared language, it is so important. It is so critical to have something that we're all jumping from, even though we're all coming at this differently. The shared language is so important. And so I think it just sets that tone. People understand the why. I think you also get a chance to kind of share some data and acknowledge some history about kind of why we're even investing in this work. Um, But I would say that's important. And then the last thing I would say is just when it comes to education, it's very important that it's not just cerebral, that it's not just academic, right? Like that's super important. I am all about data and research and information, but you have to make sure you're telling stories, right? Like we connect not just with our heads, but with our hearts. And that's what's going to help people really get it when they can feel others' pain, when they can feel others' experience and connect with that and empathize, that's going to keep them motivated to actually take that learning and applying it. So those are some of the things that resonate for me. (laughs) No, that's awesome. And, you know, I I always find it really fun, right? I think think that's the right word to describe what I'm going to say. I don't know. Other people would be like, that's what you call fun, Deanna? Yes, this is what I call fun. But it's like really fun to bring diversity, equity, and inclusion, like the practices into the teaching of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? So being able to like mm-hmm. know that everybody's not going to learn it the same way, know that everybody's not starting in the same place, know that everybody's end goal is not the same too, right? Like how do we bring those same, how do we live even in the teaching of what we're what we're trying to bring to the table? How do we live the, the principles? And I think you just so beautifully like laid that out, right? Like Let's get on a place where we can actually have conversations. Let's share our stories. Let's show up and show who we are and, and all of that. It's huge, 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 huge. So that's it wonderful. Is, and you bring up a good point about acknowledging the resistance. And I think that's something when you're doing the learning that is critical, like acknowledge the elephants in the room. I know you love elephants, so I think you'll <laughs> like that analogy, but acknowledge it. Like we may all be showing up here differently. And what I think it's important for organizations to do is still connect it to the values, the behaviors of your organization, right? Right. Like, so getting that everyone may not be drinking the Kool-Aid, as I say, but this is how it connects our organization. And if you say you buy into what we're trying to do, here you go. Here's the line. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. That's awesome. Very good. Well, one thing I can't let you go without talking about, because one of the things that Ashley did that was amazing was actually come to our last summit with a whole team from Advocate Aurora. And we loved having the team there, but 
what you did that was like even one step further and actually became like the thing that I looked forward to and Justin, you know, looked forward to was hearing your debriefs at the end of the day. So we don't have a lot of time, but I would love to just hear if you don't mind sharing, you know, just a little bit about your experience. Cause that was a, you know, a learning experience with your team. Like what, what did that feel like? What came of it? Um, I'm not asking for a free commercial. I just <laughs> genuinely like learned so much in your recaps that I'd like our audience to be able to learn from that too. Yeah. And I will say like disposing, I have not been paid, but <laughs> at all, this is just free will. And, and for me, it was, you know, sharing with my, my social media community was a way for me to really like bring to life what I was taking away. I think it's one thing to kind of passively do these learning experiences and conferences. It's another thing to really say like, what is this meaning for me and my leadership and how is this challenging me and helping me to become more aware, all those things. So that to do this with my team, and this was now our second cohort of folks. So I had an, another cohort who attended the previous and we've since communicated. I just think it really affirmed a lot for us as folks who've committed to this work in our organization and in our lives, as we've said, um, it is something to be in community with others and to hear some of the same challenges and to see some of the opportunities that lay before you. And it was just such a well done conference. I mean, so to have, and it was all virtual, of course, but I still felt connected to everyone in that virtual space. Um, the shared content, the resources, the tools, the language to be empowered, the framework of allyship as more than just a word, you know, it's not a noun, it's a verb and how we live it out. Um, just so applicable. And we've continued to digest it over the weeks past the conference. And it'll continue to be, a, I believe, a staple for how we elevate this work in our space and uh, in our community. So, so many major takeaways. We'd need a whole other <laughs> conversation, but it was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you to your crew. <laughs> well, thank you. I, you know, one of the things that I think I always get, I love people coming to the, the summit. We have people who come as individuals. We have people who come in, with teams. We had, you know, a team of 75, we had a team of 50. We had, yes. we had like a hundred people who just, you know, a hundred or two, I think 150 or so people who just came by themselves. Like, so we get such a beautiful mix in that room, mm -hmm. but what makes me so excited is that people use it right? Like people are using yeah. it. Like they're, I, you know, one of my favorite emails from this last year, like bar none was from one of the people on your team who had like 15 things there, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and they were like, these are the things that we've decided to do as, as a team. And I was like, this is awesome. Right. Oh, I and I put it in my smile file. Cause I'm like, this is awesome. So on my days where I'm like, what is, what's the, why, why are we here? What are mm -hmm. we doing? Um, I go back to things like that because it's a reminder that each of us has a different role to play. Right. And we know that the mm -hmm. summit is good for a, a large group, a, a large group of people who are trying to find that experience, that moment of reflection that you talked about, right? The opportunity just to, to sit with some of these ideas and, and these mm -hmm. topics, not to sit and sit in guilt, but to sit and think, what does this look like to move forward? How, what's Absolutely. my role in that? So anyways, I, I loved it. I was like, oh, let me tune in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so great because you all acknowledge the complexity and the history. You're not disconnecting that, right? Like, yes, this is complex work and there's a deep, there's deep history and this is deadly stuff, right? Like you're not ignoring that, but you're also empowering people to say, and I can do something about it, right? And I can be part of making sure that the generations to come and even present don't continue to experience those, you know, those, those things. So Hey, yeah. Well, thank you Thanks for sharing. <laughs> I, I do. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I really do appreciate it. And you have an interesting perspective, just having thank had you. so many people come through it. So we are at the end, unfortunately, of our, of our time together, <laughs> this, this go round, but I would love, I know that there's people who want to know more about what you're doing, kind of what the organization is doing. What's, the, what's the best ways to stay connected to you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I am active on LinkedIn. So that is certainly the best way to connect to me. And Advocate Aurora is active on every platform. So feel free to look <laughs> us up on any of those. And I work very closely with our brand and our communications team to make sure that we are truly having communications that reflect the communities that we serve and want to continue to serve and represent our team members. So that's the best way to get me. I am very approachable, though. So reach out. Love to hear from you. 
Awesome. So we'll make sure we put all of that information in the show notes. Ashley, thanks for being with us. Thank you. What a pleasure. <laughs> we are so glad to all of our listeners out there for tuning in to another week's episode of Uplifting Impact, our podcast. We know that we need more people, more people who are out here with Ashley and I trying to create some impact, right? Like trying to uplift the impact, not just create it, but uplift the impact that's going to make the world a place where everybody can thrive. In order to do that, We would ask that you do your part too. If there is something in this episode that really touched you, share it with us. You know, if you have other questions, share it with us. If there's somebody that you know could really benefit from this, and I know everybody can benefit from learning from Ashley, so share it with them. Um, We love to hear from you. You can always do that right on our website at www.upliftingimpact.com, or you can provide your insights to us directly on LinkedIn. We're super active there also. And until next week, we just ask you to keep on uplifting the impact. Thanks so much, everyone.